So with that, I am very excited to hand the reins over to Dr. Jean Goodwin to tell us all a little bit more about um, communicating scientific uncertainty. Great, thank you for the welcome. Um, as I was saying uh, earlier, it's a pleasure to be here, particularly since Zoom makes it easy just to squeeze a visit to Rhode Island in, in the morning of uh, on this, uh, <laughs> Friday. Um, so I am here to talk about scientific uncertainty, which I think for um, is an interesting topic both for scientists, but also for science communication research. If you're a scientist, um, you spend a lot of time in your graduate career learning not just about how to gather data that's good, but learning about the uncertainties of that data. Um, how the, every field has its own categorization of different kinds of uncertainties, its own ways of expressing those uncertainties. Um, so a lot of being a scientist is actually knowing about uncertainties and having a very complex uh, knowledge of that. By contrast, um, when we're talking about that, I'm not going to talk about any of that. <laughs> um, when we're talking about how to communicate to the public, uncertainty is actually kind of much more simple and straightforward. Um, uncertainty is largely the um, just the gap between certain knowledge and what we actually have, which is always uncertain. Um, and so the public is not so much interested in all of the kind of um, microscopic differences that your uh, graduate training will be giving you, but into kind of the big picture. And in particular today, I want to focus on uncertainties um, for people making decisions. Because uh, that's often, like if you go to the, if you go to an aquarium and you listen to a talk about sea life, um, and it's that you're there for the wonder of science or to, you know, to, cause you think science is cool and you like to learn stuff. Uncertainties don't really matter so much when we're talking about galaxies or the beauty of different kinds of coral reefs. Um, it may not be that necessary to express uncertainties. By contrast, uncertainties are key in decision-making. So, um, I'm most interested in both, uh, collective decision making, like how we decide to build a dam or how the USGS decides how much water to let through um, a dam, but also personal decision making like health decisions that have to be made. Um, and that uncertainty is uh, of interest there. Since I am talking about uncertainty, let me start by acknowledging that there is a lot of uncertainty about how to communicate uncertainty. Um, what are some of the limitations? The types of uncertainties that need to get communicated are diverse. Um, we're mostly interested in, um, in scientific uncertainties of various kinds, but hey, intelligence analysis, like uh, you know, what's, happening, what's really happening in North Korea right now, that is, there's major uncertainties there and the intelligence community has its own disciplined way of thinking about those things uh, for public decision-making. Financial uncertainty, if you're an investor or if you work for a, uh, any kind of big bank or whatever, you know a lot about uncertainties because you wanna make money, but the future is uncertain. So there's a lot of different kinds of uncertainties or sources or domains of uncertainty. Um, there's a lot of different ways of communicating it. Um, the research on scientific communicating uncertainties comes from a lot of different subfields that have all come to look at the topic from very, very, very different perspectives, applying different methodologies and different theoretical constructs. And finally, up to recently, the amount of research on this topic was relatively slim. But this is a chart from a recent lit review that shows that it, um, it's become exponentially really more interesting um, as science communication and the importance of getting science into decision making has become a, a topic of interest across fields. All right, that's what I'm going to do, talk about communicating scientific uncertainties to uh, publics and decision makers in particular. Um, what do you guys want to know? I want to break you out into groups for about three minutes and I want you to do a lightning round where you say, tell each other, what are the uncertainties that you're most interested in? And then come back and post it to chat. Let's see what we have. So Sunshine, can you get people out into breakout groups? Yes, I can. I will do that right now. Okay, so come back with an idea of the kinds of uncertainties that you're interested in communicating to the general public. What are they about? 
What's the source of uncertainty? What's the decision context? Gene, are you going to join a room or should I move them around? Um, I'm not going to join a room. Okay. Then I will move someone. Got it. Yeah, I'm, I'm the kind of teacher that likes to walk around and listen in to what people are saying, but it's just impossible on Zoom. Because I know. You can't be there unobtrusively. Yeah, you I agree. You can't be next to the group. And <laughs> if you're there, then you take up too much space, so. I agree. Ellis, are, are you not able to join a group? Maybe they've run to get coffee. Maybe. Hello, Shubham. We are um, just in uh, breakout groups right now, and we just started them. So I'm going to move you to one, if that's okay. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Sure thing. If, if Zoom allows me to, that is okay. Here we go. All right, good. So um, I hope uh, I hope you are well. You're feeling good? Yeah, like everybody, I, I mean, I got in the habit of saying, I'm okay. Yeah, <laughs> understood. It's, it's impossible to really feel 100%. Understood. <laughs> um, everyone, everyone is facing the, their own different challenges, and I don't know anybody that, that, has, that isn't, doesn't have some. Indeed, understood. How about you? Yeah, well, yeah, I guess uh, very much the same. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to like look at, at people in different breakout rooms right now and make sure they're all set. Um, yeah, same. Um, you know, hanging in as much as I can. There are days when I feel like I'm losing my mind, but. <laughs> okay, can you like, hit the one minute button? I'm like, sorry? Hit the, and um, turn off the, the focus groups. That'll give them 60 seconds to come okay. back. So they're, they're three right. minutes are up. Done. So it looks like some people already came back. All right, those of you that are coming back, post your post the kinds of uncertainties you want to communicate in the chat. Just describe them in a few words. All right, everybody's coming back. Um, so just post a few words or a phrase about the kinds of community of uh, uncertainties you're, that you're interested in communicating into chat. Climate change. Do we have any meteorologists here? Post, I'd be interested in that. Model uncertainties. Um, I think that's, uh, I think that's going to be an emerging area of research, how to communicate model results to publics. The pandemic has just increased that. Climate. Um, yeah. 
Statistical uncertainties generally, that's a great one. It should be built into the regular curriculum of science. Mm -hmm. Audience interest, well, that's a very general communication topic. Sources of uncertainty. What else? Fish biomass uncertainty. Okay, good. That's a really specific one. All right. So these are mostly, I'd say, climate and environmental related, um, which is good. That way, um, y'all will have some, uh, some shared understandings uh, coming out of this. All right. So what do I want to do today? Um, I want to talk about two general topics. Um, the first is, should uh, scientists and science communicators Com communicate scientific uncertainties? Is that important information or is it more important to get across a central message? And secondly, if you should do it, or if you decide to do it, how to do it? Um, so let's go to question number one. Should scientists or science communicators convey uncertainty information to general publics and uh, decision makers? Here, the answer I think is actually relatively not uncertain. I mean, I think we actually have certainty. If your role is to support good decision making, um, yes, you should communicate uncertainties to your audience. Uh, why is that? Well, partially it's because honesty is intrinsic to science. That's what science is about, is facing up to the facts of data, all the good and bad, um, that's what we count on scientists to do for us. That's the job of scientists in general. Further in decision-making context um, in specific, um, full disclosure is generally required if you want to preserve your status as an honest broker. I don't know if you've heard that phrase before, but if you want to, if you want to be a trusted advisor across party lines and across different ideological divides, um, people are going to count on you to communicate the truth and the whole truth, including the uncertainties, uh, and not to edit it a little bit to favor one side or the other. That does imply that if you're in a different role, like if you're in an advocacy role, it may actually be appropriate to not communicate about uncertainties, but to try to take the data and make the strongest argument you can. But you should be very upfront with yourself and with others about whether or not you're an advocate or an advisor, uh, advisor, an honest broker, a person who's really trying to help people make good decisions, not make the decision that you like, but make a decision in the right manner. Um, if, you're, if that's your goal, then you really should be communicating uncertainties. All right, why does this seem to be too easy an answer? <laughs> um, here's a poll. You tell me. Um, why aren't you just filled with enthusiasm about going out and communicating scientific uncertainties? <laughs> what are your top concerns? The public only wants certainty. They don't want it, any wishy-washy answers. Uh, if you communicate uncertainty, then you're going to be destroying the public trust in scientists in general and you in particular. If you communicate uncertainties, People are going to, you know, the evil people are going to um, take what you say and twist it and argue against positions that you, can, that you like or that people, the public pretty much just won't understand. Okay, we got a few more votes coming in. Okay. Uh, any more votes? All right, let's take a look and here's what we got. Um, so most of you are interested that scientists just, I mean that the public just doesn't want to hear uncertainties, they just want to know the right answer from scientists. And we got some interest in uh, the problems of public trust or the problems of distorting political decision making. And a tiny amount down there at the bottom for uh, the public just won't understand. All right, I wanna look at these four concerns and see what the research says. Cause those are all empirical, a lot of those are empirical questions. Like what happens when you communicate scientific uncertainty? All right, number one, um, uh, to what extent does the public demand 
certainty. Like that's the only thing they want. Now it is, if you think that the public doesn't want uncertainty information, you're up there with a lot of other experts. When people, the people that have surveyed experts find that experts think that the public doesn't want uncertainty information. Um, and it is true that no human being likes to make decisions under uncertainty. We would much rather have all decisions to be more like, you know, choosing what brand of toothpaste than choosing what policy to address climate change. Like they make our lives a lot in, more easy and we could just go about our business. Um, it's called like uncertainty avoidance and big ambiguity avoidance. We don't like uncertainty. However, if you ask people whether they want that information when it exists, they say, yes, they do. Um, the public, you know, there's a whole series of studies on a variety of issues like food risks, weather information, um, even contested topics like endocrine disruptors, and they uniformly find that ordinary people want to know about the uncertainties. In addition, they survey journalists. Journalists want to know it too. Scientists often think that journalists suppress this information or don't manage it correctly. Well, journalists are trying to do their job and they want to have it. And then finally, um, uh, professionals who are using this information like within their uh, official decision-making capacities, they want it to. In fact, the studies find that if you don't give them uncertainty information, they make it up themselves. So uh, weather, when deterministic weather forecasts are, are uh, issued, like so tomorrow the temperature is gonna be 50 degrees, people in fact insert their own range. They say, oh yeah, okay, that means it's between 45 and 55. Well, which, which would you rather have them do? Make up their range or communicate what the science actually says about the range? And obviously it's better to give them the more accurate information. So people do want this. They want it, even though it hurts, they, they definitely want it. Um, what will disclosing uncertainties do to public trust in you in particular and science in general? Okay, the studies are all over the place. Um, in part because the construct of trust is complex and everybody's measuring a slightly different thing. Um, and also because I think it's increasingly clear that there's no general answer to this question. There's a lot of highly contextual answers to this question. So some early, you know, the earliest hypothesis was that if you communicate uncertainties, you're gonna be taking a hit because it looks like you're really not doing your job as a scientist, which is to know stuff. Um, and there, there are a few studies that have shown that, yeah, you communicate uncertainties that, that you take, a, you're, you're trusted a little bit less. On the other hand, there's some studies that show that you're actually trusted more. Why? Probably because you're obviously being really honest. And so we trust honest people, even when they're giving us news that we, that we really don't like. Some studies have shown that there's absolutely no impact, no detectable impact of communicating uncertainties. The public kind of expects it, and that's just what scientists do. Um, the more the emerging research, I think, is on this idea that uncertainty communication, um, the relationship to trust is highly contextual. It may depend on the kind of issue, like how contested it is or what the source of contest is. Um, it may depend on the kind of uncertainty, like if experts disagree, that, that actually does take a hit to trust, which is kind of reasonable because you don't know which expert you're listening to. Um, in particular, there's an emerging result that um, the audience's understanding of what science is and can do has an impact on what they do with the uncertainty information. So that the more people believe that science produces right answers, like the text, the uh, sixth grade textbook idea of science, that it's a big book with all the right answers in it. Um, the more people think that, the more that uncertainties kind of bother them because they think of it as science not doing its job. That suggests that in addition to um, um, communicating the uncertainties, we want to also be communicating about the nature of science, like that science is a process of moving from less uncertainty to, or from more uncertainty to less uncertainty, that, it's always open to revision. The more people understand that, the less hit to trust that uncertainty communication seems to, seems to do. All right, so maybe we're concerned about uncertainty and political action. And it definitely is true that if you're communicating on an issue like climate change, which is involved in a big political debate, all the sides are gonna take what you say and spin it in their direction to the extent that they possibly can. That's, if you don't communicate uncertainties, People are gonna spin that. 
they're going to accuse you of being an alarmist. If you do communicate uncertainties, they're going to spin that and accuse you of not knowing. So um, there's no getting around. That's what politics is, is trying to make the most of the available information. Um, is, it, is it worse to communicate uncertainties? Does uncertainties have a worse hit? Um, if you think about it, you realize, actually, no, that uncertainty is a reason for action, <laughs> right? Uncertainty sometimes produces stasis and inaction, but other times the very existence of uncertainty produces faster action. We buy insurance when we're uncertain about whether or not, you know, our house is going to burn down. We, we do take action. We buy insurance. Um, one of the best examples of this was Silent Spring. Um, that Silent Spring 1962, very beginnings of our understanding of the impact of chemicals on uh, ecosystem health. Um, and Rachel Carson was very upfront. I mean, she has lots of declarations of uncertainty, and that was the invitation for action. There's a great article on this by colleagues, uh, my colleagues Kenny Walsh and uh, uh, Kenny Walker and Linda, Linda um, Walsh, now Linda Ullman. Um, that you should really take a look at because it was the uncertainties that allowed the audience to step in and say, hey, this is something I'm concerned about and we can't wait for the science. We need to take action now. So the strongest environmental regulation in the U.S. was actually based on uncertainties, not on certainties. And there's no reason that we can't go back to that kind of, uh, uh, that, that frame for activism. Um, and finally, so you guys weren't all that worried about this one and you're right. Uh, will people understand uncertainties? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they won't understand them in the same way you'll understand them, but people have been making decisions under uncertainties, under conditions of uncertainty, since people have been making decisions. That's almost the definition of what a decision is. Like, we don't know what's gonna happen. We're trying to figure out the best course forward. We weigh all sorts of possibilities, but we always know we can be wrong. Aristotle said that 2,500 years ago, um, and it's still true today. There's been some studies where you provide people in uncertainty information, um, like this one, you put undergraduates into a situation where they have to make their road managers, they have to decide whether or not to put very expensive salt onto the roads to prevent them from freezing over. If they spend too much money, the, the little town goes bankrupt. If they don't spend enough money, people have accidents on icy roads. Um, if you give them deterministic forecasts, like the forecast is 35 degrees tomorrow night, they don't do so well. If you give them uncertainty information, like the, the chart on the left that shows where you are and how certain is, is it going to be that it'll freeze to, uh, tomorrow night, um, they actually make much, much better decisions. Um, they, they ice, they de-ice in, the, in a much more proper amount, not spending too much money, but saving a lot of lives. Um, all right, so to summarize, um, should you communicate uncertainties? Yes, um, people really do want them. Um, it probably, there's no clear evidence that you're going to take a hit to trust. It may even increase trust. Uncertainty can inspire action and publics can handle uncertainties if they're communicated correctly. So let's go on to uh, point number two, which is okay, how to communicate them. Uh, there's a lot of different means for communicating uncertainties, verbal means, uh, using words, numerical means, which is often what scientists themselves are comfortable with, and then emerging visual means. So which ones should we use? Like, how's the best way to do it? All right, I want to send you back into focus groups and I want you to, uh, into the breakout groups, and I want you to give me a really simple answer to this question. Providence, Rhode Island, 2050 sea level rise. It's predicted between two inches and two feet. <laughs> that probably makes a difference for decision making in Providence. Um, why is there such a big difference? It depends on which set of scenario, which method you use to make the future prediction. Um, whether you have a kind of straight line that it's going to continue to go up at the same rate that it currently goes up, or whether you have a more complex um, scenario system based on the IPCC scenarios and also and various other kinds of information. And each, so we have three different ways of getting to the number, and each one of those ways has its own uncertainties associated with it. 
all right, how would you communicate not only the information, but its uncertainties to decision makers, homeowners, developers, city, city officials in Providence? Um, can you send people off into focus group? And this again, you got three minutes, so make a decision quick. I just made, I just uh, wrote this in the chat, everyone. So you have the question to reflect on. Great. Okay, they're all in there. Okay, I hope you all solved this problem because we need to solve this problem and it has to be done by somebody, namely you. <laughs> Are we pretty much all back? Yeah, we are. Okay, so I'm um, opening a poll. Tell me kind of in the big picture, how are you gonna communicate this information? Are you gonna wor use words like, um, it's likely that we're gonna have two feet of sea level rise or, um, are you going to give ranges, a number, give 90% certain that the sea level rise is going to be at least one foot? Uh, are you going to use some kind of visual method? Show flood zones. Uh, well, showing flood zones is communicating the information. How would you, you'd need to use some sort of additional overlay to show the uncertainty information. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll. Here's what we got. Um, a lot of you, okay, so um, using a map, some kind of visual is the preferred solution. And that's kind of understandable because of the, I mean, I put a map up there. And so you're kind of primed to think about that. And that helps people think about, you know, where is the sea level going to be? Um, using words is a second favorite. That's, that's pretty common. Um, and then uh, only a small number of you want to use numbers, though. So let's see what the research says about this. Um, I want to um, I want to look at um, the overall. Um, basically, I want to tell you the bad news of each of these three major <laughs> methods: visual, numeric, and um, and uh, visual methods, and then. At the end, we'll do some talk about three emerging better practices. All right, um, verbal methods for communicating uncertainty using all this vocabulary that we have in English, possible, likely, unlikely, common, frequent. Um, we got all these words, why not use them? Um, well, let's take a look. Here's, uh, here's the next poll. So let me put it up. Your doctor tells you, I know this is kind of artificial, but your doctor, an x-ray reveals you have a specific heart abnormality that you didn't know about. And so your doctor tells you that you're likely to have a heart attack in the next 10 years. What percentage chance do you, is it that you're gonna have a heart attack in the next 10 years?
Okay, like get your votes in. All right, uh, so what, what does likely mean? <laughs> what, who knows what likely means? Some people think it means zero, 10%, 20%. <laughs> Some people mean <laughs> it means 100%. Yeah, okay, there's a normal distribution here. So most people think likely means 50, 60, 70%. But um, there's a broad range. And like, if you're making an important decision, even the dis distinction between it being 50% and 70% actually can make a difference. So the word likely, um, these studies have been done across a variety of English terms not just likely, like um, they've done frequently, they've done um, uh, very likely, they, and the same thing happens. The, you get an immense spread of how individuals actually interpret these words. Uh, it looks like individuals are pretty consistent across contexts, so that there'll be the people that are think likely is like 70% and then other people think it's like 30%. But there's even some evidence that we just change our sense of what that word means. Um, so communicators really like using words because it makes their job a lot easier. You know, you take something really complicated and you just call it likely. <laughs> that makes your job easier. Audiences don't like them. <laughs> um, they don't think that it's giving them enough in information and they're right. Um, there is a wide variation in the interpretation between individuals about what these words mean. So you think you're communicating when you use the word likely, but in fact, you're really not communicating. I mean, you are communicating that there are some uncertainties here, but the amount, you know, you're not giving people really definite information about what to do. Um, this is, you know, this has been, um, here's another version of that same idea. Um, the IPCC report very famously, they spent a lot of time pinning down the meanings, the technical meanings of each of these terms that they're going to use in their reports. And they heavily police, if you write for IPCC, you got to use these words. Um, and each one of them, you can see, has a very clear definition. Well, they did studies where they give people, um, the IPC, they give people like a quote from the IPCC, like temperatures, um, have likely increased due to anthropogenic forcing. And then they give them the table too, so that the, the people that are answering the questions get all the information they need to make a, um, to make a good judgment. Um, the control condition over here is that they don't have the chart. So that's kind of like the baseline of what likely means when people read it. And then the translation condition is when they do have the chart. But you can see that having the chart has almost no impact. That um, the right, uh, the, uh, the box is like 50% of the people answer within the box. So basically, well over a majority of people answer wrong, even when they're given all the information they need to add, uh, answer correctly. So word meaning is, you know, once it gets in your mind, you're not going to move even if you get other kinds of information. Um, okay, so words are, the general advice is like, don't rely exclusively on communicating uncertainties through verbal means. It just, it's not going to produce, it's not going to actually communicate what the uncertainties are. Um, so how about let's use numbers, which is what scientists are comfortable with, even though you guys indicated some suspicious Miss your answer, you didn't really like numbers. Um, numbers could be percentages, they could be frequency information like one in 20, or they could be a range information in various other ways. Um, all right, these two though have problems. Very much like words, we're actually not very good interpreters of these numbers. One famous study, the chance of 20% uh, chance of rain, or this morning um, my neighborhood had a 69% chance of rain, that sounds really, Wow, that's super precise. It's actually raining right now, so uh, it doesn't really matter what the chance of rain is anymore. Um, so they asked both, they asked meteorologists and they asked normal people, what does, what is to define 20% chance of rain? And nobody could do it. <laughs> Even the meteorologists who went to school for years to learn that, they don't say it right. Um, another one is, those of you that are in toxicology know this one. Um, like right now, let's say you have the COVID swab test. 
and it uh, and it says that you don't have COVID. What's the actual likelihood that you don't have COVID? It's not so. <laughs> the, the test has a 70% um, sensitivity. So you think, oh, okay, it's 70. There's 70% chance that I don't have COVID and 30%. No, <laughs> actually, you could you could be quite likely to have COVID. The test is throwing off a lot of false negatives. And if there's a lot of COVID in your area and you've been exposed, the negative test doesn't have um, an enormous, there's the base rate problem. Um, the negative test actually doesn't have that much hit on your actual probability. Two tests get you a little farther there. Um, I walk through this math with uh, undergraduates in my SciComm course and they're like amazed, but then they, they can't answer the question correctly on the exam because this is, the human brain is not built to, to deal with this, with this question. Um, they give this question to doctors and doctors get it all wrong. So interpreting um, test results when the t of something that is of something of an event that is either very unfrequent or very frequent, um, interpreting test results um, for tests that are not 100% uh, accurate, we do not we don't interpret those test results correctly. Um, that's a problem. Um, also, very much like words. It's never going to be just the numbers that that make it into the decision. Um, here's one study. I'm not going to run you through asking you to re replicate it here, but um, so Jane has a rare blood disorder. Um, she's her work is going to take her to Kolkata for a year. Her doctor tells her that she has a 30% chance of getting malaria, so she should be a little cautious. Um, how, where do you put Jane on this spectrum between impossible and absolutely certain about getting malaria? Oops, her boss changed her mind and she's gonna go to Honolulu instead. But her doctor tells her the same thing, 30%. So what is the likelihood? Well, it turns out that um, a 30% likelihood of getting um, uh, mild malaria in Kolkata is actually more likely than a 30% likelihood of getting mild malaria in um, Honolulu. Why? Well, it's clearly we're dealing with some kind of stereotype in the background that's influencing our reading of what 30% is. It's like Kolkata, of course you get malaria in Kolkata, so that's like a really big 30%, but Honolulu, nobody gets, you know, how can you get malaria in Honolulu? That's a small 30%. <laughs> um, notice too that 30% is producing results on the upper half of this line, which seems to be a little strange too. It should be around 30%, I would have thought. Okay, so um, numeric expressions are harder for people to interpret. They also have contextual variability. There's some evidence that people process frequency information, like one in 20, better than they process uh, percent information, like 5%. But then there, that's, the evidence is mixed on that. Um, you can present ranges, like there's between a one in five and a, you know, uh, sea level rise will be, be between six to nine inches in uh, Providence. Um, there's some evidence that people uh, select which side of that range that they like based on their prior opinions about the subject, like, oh, only six inches, or wow, as many as nine inches. Um, so they're not, they're not understanding that or the range is probably has a normal distribution behind it, and the best answer is probably seven and a half inches, right? Okay, so uh, numeric expressions, also problematic. Let's go to visual expressions. Now, our increased, you know, it used to be that producing visuals was a lot of work. Now, um, we have all sorts of computer tools that will help us produce very elaborate infographics actually quite easily. And there's emerging research that goes in and just tries to find out how people interpret this. And like, here's uh, four different ways of uh, presenting some uncertainty information on a uh, bar graph. Uh, which, how do people read them? You know, which one of these is better? So uh, this is emerging research and we should follow it and figure out best practices and start using them, which will be great. But the background sense is that visuals are not going to be an automatic solution to the problems of communicating uncertainty. Um, why? It's because visuals, they're not, they're, um, 
you know, we have the, we have the idea a picture is a, worth a thousand words. No, there's actually quite a lot of skills involved in interpreting information out of images. Um, and until people have the right skills, the image may uh, not convey anything or may convey false things. One of the best studies on this that y'all may have heard of is was an early study on um, what does this hurricane map mean? You know, what does the cone of uncertainty mean? Um, one of the most dominant interpretations was that this is the zone of damage. The hurricane's getting bigger and bigger, <laughs> which is actually the opposite. The hurricane is likely getting smaller and smaller. But it's so if you uh, if you're down there at the bottom, the hurricane's really narrow, so you don't have to worry about it very much. But the higher up it goes, it's getting bigger, and you got to worry more. No, that's not right. Other people are a little more accurate. They say, okay, the hurricane is going to, the track of the, the center of the hurricane is going to be somewhere within these bounds. That's a little better, but it, um, there, it's only within these bounds about two thirds of the time. So if you're one inch, you know, if you're a microscopic amount outside of that a dark looking line around the cone of uncertainty, you're not that much safer than if you're one, one millimeter inside of that line. Um, the tracks, hurricanes are unpredictable, the tracks go all over the place. So increasingly, you, this, this visual is still being used, but increasingly I'm seeing um, ensembles, like just show us a whole bunch of tracks and not try to, um, not try to focus us on, this, on the central track quite so much. Um, unfortunately, this has been shown to be true, not just for general publics, but for decision makers as well. So here's uh, probably what's the most important chart in the IPCC reports, and it's in the summary for policymakers. So it's not in the technical part of the report, it's in the part of the report that decision makers are supposed to be using. Well, a study was done where they went all over the world talking to climate policy analysts in a variety of settings. These are the kind of like, not the political people, but the professional people that are working in advocacy groups or climate bureaucracies all over the world. And they asked them to talk through, look at this chart and talk through what they saw. And nobody, there's multiple kinds of uncertainties built into this table. Um, there's model uncertainties. There's data uncertainties back there where the, you know, we didn't have very good data. There's socioeconomic uncertainties in the different scenarios. They're expressed differently. Like we have the, both the gray bars on the far right and then we have the colored bars around each of the different models. Really, nobody, got, nobody could get this right. Um, that's, that is significantly disturbing because uh, there's a lot of information here and this is like the summary of the entire working group one report about the impacts of climate change and it's not being effectively conveyed by this visual. All right, so um, on its own, verbal, numeric, and visuals, there's no magic bullet. That's generally the case with science communication. There is no one way to do it that is going to be right. Like you want to take an hour and a half workshop on this and get the right answer? Sorry, that's not the way it is. Um, but I can tell you, I, I don't want to leave you on that hopeless note, um, I can tell you that there are three practices, three kind of general critical thinking or practical skills that you can use to get to better results in your science communication of uncertainties. Um, so three emerging good practices. Um, number one is to stop thinking about the communication of uncertainties as just one way between you and your audience. Like you're the scientist or the science communicator and your audience is out there. Really, it's a highly two-way process it's a, and it's longer. It's not just one off, like, here you go, here's your, uh, here's your information, here's how uncertain it is. It's an ongoing discussion with you and your stakeholders about how to communicate. Um, what you're trying to do is create what in, uh, in technical terms uh, in some fields is called a boundary object. That is something that people share, like they're getting together around the kitchen table. The kitchen table is a boundary object. We all have slightly different perceptions of what the kitchen table is and what it can do for us or why we're there. Like we don't have the exact same view of it, but we have our own views and it's good enough. I mean, it's good enough to promote communication between people. And uh, weather predictions are a good example of that, even though nobody can define it in the same way. Uh, scientists are happy giving weather predictions, 20% chance of rain, and people are happy 
people, we know how to use that information to make decisions about whether to take umbrellas or to plan outdoor gatherings on some days. So um, over the years, people have learned from scientists how to interpret it and scientists have learned from people what makes them mad. <laughs> um, like there's a lot of evidence that, um, that uh, weather meteorologists, when they make the final, it's still a judgment call about what the percentage of chance of rain is. And they tend to make it a little higher because people get really, they're the false negative, false problem, false negatives about rain and false positives about rain are not evaluated equally by the public. People are mad when it rains when it wasn't expected. And so they, meteorologists tend to pump up the uncertainty a little bit um, to protect themselves. But that's okay, that's what the public wants. Um, so what does this mean? You don't have one-off uh, communication efforts. If you're serious about communicating uncertainties, you should expect a relatively long process of negotiating about how to do that and get some social scientists involved. They can make the conversation easier if you can, get, if you can afford it. A really good example of this was a, um, was a massive effort with the, um, with the basically meteorology climate uh, unit in Germany. Uh, they produce weather information and they started to use ensemble forecasting, which allows very precise predictions, very highly localized predictions, but very also uncertain predictions. Um, and they wanted to make sure that this was getting across well to all of the constituencies that use this information, like emergency managers, people who salt the roads, people who take care of electric system and worry about shutdowns. Um, and they collected all sorts of kind of data. Some of it was just passive data, like what parts of the website, then they put it up, what parts of the website were being used and not being used? How, where do people click and not click? Um, they did surveys to find out what people liked and didn't like and how they were interpreting the information. And then they also did long conversations where they would meet with the actual people over a period of years talking about what, what was working, what wasn't. So there's a lot of listening going on in addition to a lot of communicating going on. Um, that's a big project, but if you're serious about communication of uncertainties or communication of science in general, you should think about trying to do smaller versions of that every time you undertake a, ma a communication project. Um, what do you want to do? You want to focus on, there's a lot of ways to misunderstand the uncertainty information. You need to find out what ways your audience is misunderstanding and you need to try to correct those specific misunderstandings. So there's no general right way, but there are, a, you may be facing very specific wrong ways and you can do a little better by figuring out what those wrong ways are and making sure that those don't occur. Then something else will occur. You know, people will still misunderstand, but at least you've gotten them, you know, like one step up. Um, for example, with the IPCC case, uh, giving people a word and a table doesn't work. But it works better if you put the word and the number into the same sentence. That way they can't get, you know, they don't lock into the sense of what likely is that then doesn't get changed by looking at the table. They get the likely information and the 60, that means more than 66%. They get those two pieces of information at the same time. They've got to process it at the same time and they um, you get better answers out of it. So notice there you're coupling two different forms of communication, each of which has problems, but together they kind of correct each other's problems. Um, this has been confirmed with various other studies. So couple new, uh, verbal with numerical. Um, if you give a range, give a, also a visual of a normal distribution to prevent people from latching on to the two ends, which are likely to be the least likely parts of the range. Um, you, um, or have a map that has probability information like 5%. Um, but then add a mouse over where people can get a translation of 5% into 1 in 20, which will help them process it better. So uh, figure out what the problem is, like where the key source of misunderstanding is, and try to build in additional information to your communication that will address exactly that problem. And then finally, um, whatever you do, you want to explain the sources of communication. This goes back to the idea that um, some people's misunderstanding of uncertainty is based on their misunderstanding of the nature of the scientific process itself. Um, and so you can use uh, any science communication as an opportunity to educate people about science, not just to convey information, but to 
convey how science works and um, make them better consumers, improve their ability to critically think about science in general, including critically think about your message. Um, so the source of uncertainty helps us deal with like, is this uncertainty going to go away? Um, is the uncertainty just inherent, like it's randomness? There's increasing, inf I think there's increasing evidence that COVID is partially just random. Um, that uh, there, if it's spreading through super spreader events and you happen to have a super spreader event in your neighborhood, that produces a lot of cases that are then more likely to have more super spreader events. So you just, you know, it's path dependent. If like Vietnam, you miss, you know, you miss any super spreader events or you catch the early ones and, and smush it, then you're gonna be in better shape. But it's not from virtue, it's actually just from randomness. Um, it could be that we lack information, in which case maybe we should put off decision-making until we have more information. Or it could be that we got plenty of information, but our current science, there's all sorts of, you know, how we process that information, the model, uncertainty is built into models and methodologies, that's important to, um, it's important to know that those are the sources because those are unlikely to change very quickly. Um, we should also be upfront about all of the possible uncertainties, including that we're uncertain because scientists currently are disagreeing about something. Like don't cover that up. And also we should be admitted if we're uncertain because science has been distorted from various kinds of social pressures in the past. Like uh, maybe only white people were tested. Uh, and that produces uncertain uh, knowledge. Or maybe, um, maybe there's such an influence of big money in some area of research that the results are just not trustworthy because people are tossing out. Re you know, funded research will maybe like in pharmaceuticals are just tossing out results that they don't like, therefore producing a lot of really, really good results. Um, Science needs to be upfront about these more systemic problems um, that also produce uncertainties. And notice again, this helps people understand science. Um, it helps them demand better science, which is, yep, it may hurt in the, in the short run, but in the long run, it'll help the scientific process go better. Okay, so let's get back to, to uh, this problem. Um, uh, does anybody, I mean, I can send you back to your groups, but like, how do you want to communicate sea level rise? What kind of ideas do you have? Put them in chat and then I might even ask you to unmute yourself and like, oh, talk. <laughs> And believe me, there's no right answer, so there really can be no wrong answers to this either. Okay, yeah, so first of all, you wanna think about your different stakeholder groups and seriously consider whether you're lumping them all together. Um, okay, Ken, what, give me one stakeholder group for us to focus on. Homeowners. Homeowners. Uh, they're really diverse and they don't all take uh, information in the same way and they may not trust uh, any given source of information equally. So they're, they're, they seem to be like the most difficult group to reach in my mind. Okay, but they all have one thing in common, which is their home. <laughs> but right? which may not be near the water. I don't know. Well, they're, let's say they're homeowners in Providence. Okay, okay. So they're paying property taxes. I mean, so you think about what do they have in common? Um, okay, so how, how would we communicate? What would be some starting points for communicating the uncertainty both the information and the uncertainties about the information to homeowners in Providence. Okay, Sonia. Um, so we produce a graph. So it would be like, I'm thinking about a website. There'd be a map like this map. 
Um, and one map would be like the shoreline, um, if it's the low end projection, and one end, one would be the shoreline of the high end, and you could kind of toggle between them. Okay, Sonia, where are you? Oops. Yeah, here. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, so that was my idea, like to plot. I mean, I was like also thinking from the homeowner side and see, try to see on a map whether my area will be impacted and how likely um, I will be um, to be impacted by a flooding. Um, um, so, so if I can see that, perhaps I will be able to buy insurance or something to prevent that, or perhaps considering moving out. But if I see that um, I'm, I'm not impacted at all, so I would just stay wherever I am. So that, okay, so the map will provide, um, will provide relatively easily interpretable information to the people that aren't gonna be flooded even with the two foot. Maybe, because that two foot estimate is a, has a probability range around it, right? It's because it's a that one is a model result, so it's like there's some probability range around it. That um, do you want to communicate that? Yeah, sunshine. Well, I was just going to add an interesting um, note here, which is that uh, at the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography, which is a different campus from ours, um, for years one of the buildings had two maps side by side that basically did exactly this. Um, uh, one of them showed the low range of inundation of sea level rise around Providence, and one of them showed the high range. And obviously these two maps showed a massively different situation, right? And I worked in that building for a long time, and I heard a lot of people say, well, this high-end map is ridiculous. You know, this is a scare tactic. And so I, I just think like that's such an interesting, so people are going to respond to these different visual um, representations, as you said before, based on their own feelings. And I, anyway, yeah. just thinking of this with this example. It's confirmation bias that if, if you're presented with two options, you're gonna have a tendency to choose the option that you, makes you feel better. <laughs> um, how do, we, how do we communicate the difference between those two options? I mean, is it just like 50-50 that it's 2.5 versus two inches versus two feet, 50-50? I mean, you're, what do you think, Sonia? What kind of information do you wanna to get to give to people to help them process why there are these two different options? Well, that's a hard question. <laughs> I, I really don't know how I would, I would communicate. I thought that, I mean, I don't know anything about those models, but I was assuming that uh, when they um, come up with those um, numbers, they have a probability of that that event occurs. So I would plot that on the map, or I will kind of mention that, that oh, this is how likely you are of being flooded by 2.5 and this is how likely it is with 23 inches and and I mean if it's in homeowners um, hands to make the decision let them to do it you know um, but it would be different if I am a different stakeholder like if I am working for the town um, I don't know, perhaps I would focus more in, in areas that are cl the closest to those um, river banks or because they definitely would be affected. I mean, under any other of the models, there would be that overlap. Okay, so um, to pick up what you said at the beginning, um, so you'd want to build information in that the, that the 2.5, the two inch um, sea level rise is like 20% probable versus the two foot is 80% probable. Unfortunately, that's not, there is no information like that. These are different model results. So they're based on different, they're just based on totally different ways of modeling the future. Like the, the low end one is based on a sense that we're just going to continue linearly. The, the past 50 years of sea level rise will be the same. The next 50 years will be the same as the past 50 years. So complete linear. Um, 
The, the other two models are based on IPCC scenarios. So one of them is um, if we continue business as usual, and then the other one is like if we continue to ink, you know, I don't know which scenarios actually was, it, it wasn't clear to me from the site I got this information from, uh, not good. Um, what um, scenarios they were, but like one of them was a, maybe maybe the top one was business as usual, like we continue an exponential increase in carbon dioxide and that's gonna produce really bad results versus the a middle one, which is probably that we put in some limits on carbon. Um, and therefore control climate change at least a little bit. But there's no probable, we don't know which is we're gonna do. I mean, there's no probability that makes one of these three methods, we can't assess the probability that one of these three methods is better than the other. They're just totally three different methods. So what, what should we do to communicate the fact that there's these three totally different methods? How do we help people assess that? Any ideas? doesn't just have to be Sonia. Well, um, I mean, I would say at a minimum to go back to the idea of communicating the sources of uncertainty. You want to tell people why, th what these three models are about and the kinds of assumptions built into each of them. And then maybe even do pro con little chart, like why, that might be a good way to estimate future sea level rise and why it might be a bad way to estimate future sea level rise. That way um, it gives, it pressures people at least a little bit to think about not just to pick the one that they like the most, but to pick the one that on reflection maybe is the best one or to think about what would be the, what additional information do they want to go out and get about um, in order or what, what do they want to tell scientists to go and do um okay so uh hannah suggests that having a gradient um okay hannah talk to talk to us about that it was more of a question than a suggestion but i was just curious to know if at the 23 inches range if that was like showing the probability there instead of just the two different ranges of like here's a map with two and a half inches and here's a, a map of 23 inches having like a color gradient show that like there might be less probability of the 23 inches yeah so that the the the, uh, the 23 inches map um might have a a shore you know like a, a line or where that's like the center of the probability distribution but then it would have gradients on both it like have a blue line because it represents water. Blue line where we think what 23 inches means, but then it would have a gradient, a blue gradient stretching out in both directions, suggesting that maybe it won't be as bad as that. Um, how how much how many standard deviations of gradient do you want in there? I was just thinking like a dark blue. If you're going to use blue, so like a light blue. I I don't know. No, but I mean, like how, um, like the gradient of, goes on to infinity. <laughs> so how many where do you until want? It fades, until it would fade to like clear. Yeah, but there is no point. So that's what I'm asking. The, do you want? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I was at more asking this as a question to to you all than a, me providing a suggestion. I I don't know. Well, that's something to think about because if you put in. Um, too large, like if you go out to two standard deviations, then um, you're capturing uh, most of the most likely results, but then your range is really big. And then that allows people to select the answer that they like. And it just is giving them too, a lot of information, which often is not more useful. On the other hand, if you only give them one standard deviation, you get like a hurricane plot, there's a third chance that it's going to fall outside of that one standard deviation on both sides. So that's a problem as well. What other solutions? Anybody else want to submit one? There was one from Danielle uh, uh, earlier up. Um, Danielle, do you want to say yours? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was kind of thinking about this problem in more of a, a general term. So it's not so much of a, you know, 
uh, an if this is happening, but rather a when. So um, I was like, you know, kind of toying with the idea of instead of focusing so much on the numbers of like, okay, my house is in the 20 inch range, so it doesn't matter. It's more of a well, maybe if my house lives in the 20 inch range, then it's gonna happen in 2050, but sea level rise is happening. It's just happening, you know? I, so I think focusing on that main takeaway um, was something like a strategy that I would implement. How do you build, how do you build on turning information into that? Um, that's a great question, I guess. Hmm. Let me think about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, going back to going back to my um, the the oops yeah these oops um going back to the core messages um it's not surprising that you can't just sit here and figure out what the right way to do it is. So thinking about the communication as part of a long-term plan, like you have an idea that a map might work. Okay, make a map, <laughs> Get, you know, mock up your website, gather a focus group together and see what happens to that website when people actually use it. Like listen to them, see what they're understanding and not understanding, see what else they want. Then step two, you know, if they want additional things or if they're having misunderstandings, we go back, revise your map idea to make to solve those misunderstandings. And then I think really importantly, particularly on these climate issues, is to explain why scientists can't just tell you, right? There's multiple levels of uncertainty involved here. And um, conveying like um, conveying the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches to, to estimating sea level rise may slow down decision right now, but it prepares people in the long run to understand and think critically about the science uh, in a much more sophisticated fashion than they are now. So if you don't, if you don't start teaching people about climate modeling, um, they're not gonna get better. <laughs> so if you do teach them, it's gonna produce a lot, it's gonna slow things down right now, but in the long run, it'll produce a body of citizens and decision makers that are more capable of receiving the kinds of information that you have to share. Okay, so should you share uncertainties? Yes. Um, no magic bullets, visual, numerical, and uh, verbal method mechanisms are all highly interpretable and very easy to be misunderstood, but there are some better practices that you can adopt. Uh, none of them are easy, but they, but the, if you do them, you're more likely to reach a balance where the things you think are most important to communicate are actually getting across the audience, and they're teaching you too what they want to hear and what they're interested in. Um, I put the slides online, plus uh, the slides also have a couple pages of bibliography like this. <laughs> um, and I put some of those articles online as well so you can read some of the research literature that's backed up uh, what I'm saying. But we still got a few more minutes, so I'm open for general questions. What do y'all want to know? I'll start. Um, I have a question for you. So in your opinion, what is the, the most, imp this is a hard question, what is the, the most important aspect of uh, research related to communicating uncertainties right now? What do you feel is like the, like the biggest nut to crack or something that is exploding in so many exciting ways that you're just kind of excited to see how it pans out? Um, yeah, okay, so I'm, I'll give you just a personal response. Um, okay, so there, there might be like my personal response and then my more broad response. I'm very interested in trust in science. So I, my research comes from a humanistic background and I'm interested in the really the right ways for scientists and non-scientists to relate to each other. So I'm very interested in science communication ethics. Um, and so I think that the work that's coming out on trust in science 
and how uncertainties uh, and trust in science intersect is, uh, is very interesting. We're getting much, much more nuanced, and I think that that will help us understand our audiences better and to be able to help address their concerns. Um, if scientific information, if, if communicating uncertainties increases distrust in science, and it's because people don't really understand the nature of science, that's the problem that needs to be worked on, right? We need to have, uh, we need to start always teaching about modeling, not just teaching, not just conveying information about model results. We need to be talking a lot about how models work and how we understand models um, as a main communication objective. So I'm very interested in that intersection of uncertainty, communication, and trust. Um, on a general level, I think the most exciting work are these humanist scientist public partnership pro uh, projects, like the one that I mentioned from Germany or one that's going on right now. I was talking with you a little bit about this sunshine um, um, in North Carolina where university-based scientists, university-based social scientists and communities are gonna engage in a extended like five to 10 year partnership to develop climate, uh, particularly sea level rise information for coastal communities in North Carolina. Um, sea level rise and also um, fisheries information. And there it's, it's a long term, it's gonna involve lots of listening on both sides, like everybody listens to each other and you get the social scientists involved to make sure the conversations are going well. That's, that's what's really gonna produce change. Um, those are very, large scale projects, but I think that if you think, of, I think people can do that even in a mini way. Um, if there's an issue you really care about, don't helicopter into a community, join the community, hang out there, let people get to know you, listen to them, and you can do the same kind of thing on a much more local basis. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Hannah has a question. Cool. Um, would the source of uncertainty for climate change be mostly epistemological, methodological? Um, um, climate change is an enormous set of issues. So, th and there's plenty of issues where the dominant, the dominant source of uncertainty is experts disagree. <laughs> um, particularly once we start talking about the real problems, which is climate information on a local scale, right? There's a lot global models don't downscale. You don't just like, <laughs> you don't just, um, you don't just shrink the global model and tell me what's going to happen in my block, which is the only thing I'm really interested in. Um, and so scientists are disagreeing a lot. So there is scientific disagreement. I think it'd be good to be upfront about that. But a lot of the, a lot of the sources of uncertainty are like how to model things and what does it mean to model things? And is it a big problem if clouds are in or not in the model? Um, so helping people understand models and how to use them appropriately in decision making, that would help with the pandemic too. So um, I, think that's a, I think that's a topic of broad interest right now. Any other questions out there? All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, there is one. Um, yeah, okay. So um, politics, short-term thinking. Um, uh, that is not built into the nature of politics. That's one strategy that politicians have uh, for dealing with issues is to focus on the immediate ones. But um, if, you, if you read a lot of political discourse, you do find people talking about, they're worried about their children, okay? So that projects us out maybe 20 years. Or they're, they're worried about passing along an inheritance, like we've inherited um, an America that's in a certain state and we want to pass that on to future generations. That gets you out to about 50 years. And there's even some talk occasionally about posterity, like what we should be, how we can leave behind a better world for people 100 or more years. 
So th there are those resources in political discourse. That'd be, that's, one, that's one response. Um, a second response is that uh, we're mostly, when we talk about politicians, we mostly talk about the elected officials, but politicians, they, they're, they're, they sit on top of a large mountain of people that are, doing, that are talking about policy um, in various kinds of specialized settings, or they're just concerned citizens. And those people don't, they're, they're not elected, so they're not worried about getting um, the next election in two, four, or six years. So I would, I would not, um, I cut the slide out, but there's a series of stereotypes that scientists have of, of politics. And they all kind of make it look like scientists are really good and politicians are really bad. I distrust those stereotypes. So see what you can do to approach every human being you talk to, whether they're a politician or not, as a, as a person who is really concerned about their, about their, their community, their children's, you know, the future for their children and for future generations. Treat them like that. And then you might be surprised how well they respond. Media has simplified. Um, I have to tell you that there's a lot of research that the source, one of the leading sources of media simplification is scientists oversimplification. Oversimplification often starts in abstracts and press releases. So the first place to fight that is in your own practice. The second place to do it is to um, form partnerships with media and listen to them and understand their problems better and also help them understand your concern about oversimplification as well. Uh, good luck communicating uncertainty to Congress. Um, I encourage you to do it. Uh, I think you should take a look and see about the Republicans that are supporting uh, the existence of climate change and even anthropogenic climate change and not write off Congress. Let me say that um, Advocacy by scientists is perfectly appropriate. And if you're an advocate, you have friends and enemies. But if you're not an advocate, if you really want to go in and be an honest broker, you don't have any enemies. Every, you love every person in Congress just as much as you love the people that um, you secretly agree with. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, great. This Thank was so you. fantastic. Thanks so much, Jean Goodwin. We were really pleased to have you join us today. This was all very helpful. Um, uh, Ken and others who are interested in thinking more about working with the press, this is something that Metcalf does all the time. So, you know, let us know if you are interested in a program to explore that more. We'd love to pursue that and help you think about that. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Have a, a wonderful weekend and um, be sure to check out those slides that Dr. Goodwin provided for us. Thank you very much for that, Jean. Um, and I bid you all a good day. Take care. Take care, everyone. <laughs>